Good afternoon, everyone. Are you having an inspiring day? Are you enjoying the sessions? I have found them to be fantastic. So I'd like to congratulate uh, Consumers International for such fantastic program. And we know how hard you're working on the organization to put this event on. So kudos to all of you. I am honored to be the moderator of this session. My name is Laura Foos, and I run the Social Performance Task Force. We are a consumer protection standard setting body in financial education and financial inclusion. And we recently formulated comprehensive standards for responsible digital financial service provision. These standards spell out the essential practices that digital finance providers should implement to safeguard customers from the evolving risks associated with digital finance. As the FTC commissioner said this morning, we should not be putting all of the burden on the consumers to protect themselves from risks we actually need to hold companies accountable for their practices as well. And that's what our standards do. They outline day-to-day -day management practices that should be in place to safeguard consumers from the risks of digital finance. Over the past year, we've collaborated at length with Consumers International in our shared commitment to crafting responsible digital financial ecosystems. We acknowledge that establishing a secure and inclusive financial marketplace requires concerted efforts from a diverse array of stakeholders. And this is precisely what the focal point of this session is this afternoon, is the work that needs to be done amongst stakeholders working together. Our distinguished panelists encompass key players in the financial ecosystem, including providers, payment platforms, consumer associations, advocates. And they're going to share their respective initiatives aimed at fostering a secure and inclusive financial marketplace. In the interest of time, I'm not going to introduce you with lengthy um, bios, but in, I do invite you all to look at their bios and the programs that are attached, because. It's really an impressive lot of people sitting with us. Uh, we're going to begin by starting with some opening remarks from our panelists. And then we're going to explore solutions. This morning we, we said, we don't want to just talk about challenges, we want to talk about solutions. And so we'll explore solutions for the challenges that we face to accelerate a safer and digital, inclusive digital marketplace. Uh, we're also going to want to hear from you, so get your uh, questions going in your head so that the second part of the session, when we come to you, your, your questions will be ready. Um, so let's get started. Uh, if we want to turn on the um, film to invite our friend from New York. Can you guys see Shamina? You can see her on the side? OK, super. Welcome, Shamina. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, Shamina Singh is the founder and uh, president of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, and she's joining us from New York. Um, Shamina, how is the center unlocking opportunities through partnerships with global, regional, and local organizations to advance digital financial inclusion at scale? If you could speak to that. Sure. Um, and listen, thanks so much for everybody for indulging me to uh, phone in from New York. Um, I'm missing being with you all in person, but really uh, just want to extend my congratulations and thanks to Consumers International for um, organizing a global conference where the focus is exactly on the consumer. Let me give a bit of context. Um, as Laura mentioned, uh, increasingly, the rules, the road, the rules of the road, the the regulations, but the technology is in, is has become so complex um, 
when it comes to payments, financial inclusion, financial services. And Laura's right. The, the consumer has been on the hook in many respects to protect themselves from um, the, the, the benefits, but also the harms that the technology provides. The reason that we're here, the reason that I'm here is that MasterCard has been at this for, for some time. Just to give you a sense of the scale, um, MasterCard is a payments company uh, with a commitment to financial inclusion, but we're in 210 markets, 3 billion cardholders on the network, 100 million businesses on the network. Um, and so when we think about uh, consumers, when we think about protections, when we think about standards, that's something that we have to implement, whether they're official, whether they're unofficial from uh, guidelines. And st so as, as a global company that basically processes um, billions of transactions per minute, per day, um, it's important that we think about this stuff going in. And that's why I'm here, is because when we talk about data, when we talk about the transactions, um, it's important to know that fraud is real and fraud is happening in real time. To give you an example, in the past year, the network has blocked over $20 billion in fraudulent transactions. That means before it even gets to the consumer's bank account or credit card statement, we've blocked the payment because it's fraud or it's part of a scam. We've invested over $7 billion over the last five years in building out the capacity for cybersecurity on the MasterCard's global payment network. So the investment, the scale, but the concerns um, that we're seeing around cyber and fraud are very real. What does that mean for what I run at MasterCard, um, the Center for Inclusive Growth? We are the social impact arm of the company. We're the philanthropic hub. And our job, our remit, is to ensure that all of the technology, all of the assets, all of the data um, are in service of people and the planet. And what does that look like? I'll give you an example around data. Um, MasterCard as a company, along in, with partnership with the Center for Inclusive Growth, had created data standards four or five years ago that are very simple and consumer centric. And it basically says the consumer should be in charge of their data, they should benefit from their data, and it's MasterCard's job to protect that data. That opens up a whole part of a conversation that I'm happy to have, but I think it's an important going in point because this isn't something that all companies adopt. But when you are a company at the scale and doing the work of MasterCard, you have to think about these things on the front end rather than the back end. With many policy and many, and many governments, what we call, we partner with them um, in many respects to help think through the standards because um, we can and because we have to and because in, in the absence of a lot of conversation, we really want to make sure that we are the adult in the conversation. So let me stop there, Laura, but um, just to give you a sense of kind of what MasterCard is our principles around this work and the role of the center in that conversation. Thank you, yeah, we'll come back to you. Uh, next, we have Seema Shandil, who's the CEO of the Consumer Council of Fiji. Uh, could you please highlight the pivotal role that you've played in running the Consumer Association and in shaping and promoting safer digital finance for consumers, please? Thank you for the question and good afternoon, everyone. I know we are all tired, but I um, appreciate your attention. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to shed li light on uh, the pivotal role that Consumer Council of Fiji um, has played in shaping and promoting a safe digital uh, financial services in Fiji. Um, we have been very proactively uh, working in this space because what we have seen is a uh, lack of commitment from um, certain regulators, like, uh, you know, for digital financial services. It's the central bank in Fiji who are supposed to regulate, but we don't see that coming. So we are, um, you know, engaged from um, raising campaigns to advocacy that is educating consumers um, in terms of not only their rights, but also in terms of their responsibilities, because what we can see and based on the discussions that we have been having um, throughout the day, uh, we could see that the blame is um, totally passed on the, onto the consumers. Um, in Fiji recently, we had the biggest scam in Fiji's history. 
And because we are actively engaged in monitoring as well, um, you know, as part of our function or as part of our mandate, we were able to identify that uh, quickly that there is a pyramid scheme that is operating in Fiji. Uh, we raised awareness, we flagged it to the um, central bank, who is the regulator, as I said, but no action was taken until our um, consumers uh, you know, lost thousands of dollars, adding to millions of dollars. And as I said, that was the biggest scam. And that was also a lesson learned um, that, you know, through our campaigns and through our hard work, we could see our Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Trade forming a scam task force. So now we are happy to say that we have a, a scam task force who are working together to see how our policies and regulations can be developed um, to, to make sure that consumers are protected. I understand that you know, it's not the policies and regulations um, because uh, currently the global society is, is at the back foot in combating um, you know, the threats and the scams in the digital financial space. But we're trying to do our best. We are also aggressively engaged in advocating consumers because as I said, the blame is passed onto the consumers. So for now, what we can do is equip them with the, uh, the, the knowledge and skills that they need to have to navigate the financial, digital, digital financial um, space because we know um, that we are living in a digital era and. Uh, there is an explosion of digital financial services, especially after COVID-19. Sitting in Kenya, I was able to make uh, my bill payment, which I forgot in Fiji. But the question is, how safe is it? So um, we have seen, you know, on a daily basis in Fiji, uh, consumers are being scammed. And uh, because they are using a very prominent mobile uh, platform, which is like, I think in Kenya, we, you call it M. Pisa, we call it m -Pisa in Fiji. So it's a very similar um, platform, but we see a lack of responsibility from the developers front. And I feel um, there's a very um, little push from the central bank because what central bank, based on the complaints and continuous uh, flagging of the issues, what we could see is that uh, they feel it is just the, the role of the central bank is to approve and um, you know, assist in the development of these, these platforms. But there is no full commitment for uh, consumer protection. But again, we have seen, um, you know, our campaigns coming to fruition where there has been a working group um, known as uh, Consumer Protection and um, Capability, Financial Capability Working Group that has been formed, which Consumer Council of Fiji is part of. So that's another win for us. Um, we continue to, as I said, monitor and uh, stay, you know, um, in, in uh, upfront in the game so that we are aware of the, consum uh, the emerging trends, the consumer issues or the risk that the consumers might face. So from advocacy to campaigns to, to uh, monitoring and research and in-depth investigation, we also um, in get... Uh, we also do a lot of um, research investigations so that we can stay abreast and ahead of the evolving, um, you know, the digital financial services scams and so forth and continuously develop advocacy material to, it has to be tailor-made so that consumers are well aware of the issues and they can protect themselves. Thank you, Seema. Uh, we next are going to Robert Acholov, who's a CEO of Africa and Enda. And Robert's had a, a vast array of, of activities. If you look at his bio, he's done quite a bit um, in, different, in different areas and can actually speak quite well to the cross-border uh, questions that we're going to be asking here. So how can governments regionally leverage digital public infrastructure to address cross-border <laughs> consumer protection challenges in the digital age? And then there's a second part to the question I'd like to ask. And it's in what ways might a well-developed digital public infrastructure structure enhance regional collaboration on consumer protection initiatives? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. A very good evening and good afternoon to everybody. Um, sorry, you've given us the graveyard shift, uh, but we're going to try and keep you, uh, keep you awake. So let me start by telling a little story uh, before I answer that question. It's part of answering the question. But I was based in Cairo uh, for a couple of years. Um, and as a consumer, uh, I would once in a while, because I'm from Kenya, send some money uh, back to Nairobi. Uh, and I remember one of the days I did, uh, went to the bank, HSBC, uh, sent through the cash, um, and it didn't arrive in Nairobi. Usually it used to take about seven days. 
So I went back to HSBC and asked them, look, where, where, you know, the money hasn't arrived. And that was from my HSBC bank in, in, in Cairo to my uh, NCBA here in Nairobi. Um, so they had to send a tracer. So they sent the tracer, uh, go back, no communication, uh, go back to the bank after two weeks, no information, uh, go back after week three and said, listen guys, can you just get the money back and I'll figure out uh, a different route. And I think that is the challenge that exists with many consumers today uh, doing cross-border cross -border payments. Uh, African Nenda is focused today on driving financial inclusion because we have a 450 million uh, problem. And the 450 million is actually 450 million Africans today who still keep their money in a mattress or in a box. So they're using cash. So we're busy trying to figure that problem, but I hear us talking about the AFCFTA, continental free trade area, and trying to drive intra-regional trade uh, across the continent, which we, we all know is about 16, 17%. But the cost of what I explained to you, that, that little interaction that I went through, uh, typically in Africa, costs a consumer anything from 12% up to 24% for sending $100. And that's assuming you don't spend the three weeks I did. Uh, global average is about 6%. SDGs want to get to about 3%. So in trying to drive um, a step change and you know, get rid of some of those constraints that exist in cross-border payments, um, a couple of years, we spent some time, uh, and I'll get to the DPG question, DPI question, but we spent some time using proprietary solutions to try and solve the problem of cross-border trade in Africa. Of course, there have been some solutions that exist. Uh, Comesa Clearinghouse, which has been uh, in the market for about 10 or so years, uh, do have a solution. They use dollar uh, payments, and sorry, dollar, dollar payments, which is what we call clearing and payments, and then they also do settlement in dollars. What's interesting about the Comesa Clearinghouse is that even after about eight or 10 years of, 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 um, uh, of being uh, uh, you know, in the market, I think they do about 10 to 20 transactions a month. Uh, and, and that is actually bringing down, they can bring down the cost of that payment from 12%, uh, like I mentioned, to about 6%. But the reason they don't use it is because the banks still want to make uh, money when they're doing the cross-border payment because, of course, they use corresponding banking arrangements. So there's a very good example of lack of education of consumers because they don't know that there is a solution today that does RTGS for cross-border payments within 21 countries in Comesa. And therefore, when you go to your bank and you want to do a cross-border payment within Comesa, they will route it through uh, New York. Uh, and that costs Africa on an annual basis about $5 billion a year. Um, we got involved in, 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 um, in developing what is now known as the Pan-African Payment and Settlement Platform, PAPS. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened, which again talks to the next sort of pain point, was the fact that one of the central banks uh, decided that they're not going to agree to instant payments. So when the money is leaving their country, it'll be T plus one. Coming in, they didn't have a problem, but when it's leaving, it was T plus one, but above the line, uh, communication to the consumer is instant payment. There's an example of lack of clarity and lack of own openness in terms of actually sharing information uh, with, with the consumers, which again presents uh, a big problem. So when I look at some of the solutions that exist, the issue of a harmonized policy arrangement at a continental level is way overdue. Uh, the UK has gone through what they're calling PSD 2, I think they had PSD 1, which was probably about eight or so years ago. But today there's no harmonized policy arrangement for Africa for cross-border payments. So I think that's the first issue. Policy is, is, is fundamental, and I know with you know, the, the earlier session they were talking about the digital trade protocol. We've been working on with the AFCFT on that as Africa Nenda, but there's still a way to go around a pol policy harmonization piece. To Laura's second point, and I know that um, you know, those two questions need a little bit more time, but I'll try and summarize, is opportunity then of how do we drive uh, digital public infrastructure. And I think there was a panel um, earlier today around how India has been instrumental in, in, in setting up what people now call DP, DPIs. And they based it on three core elements. ID, digital ID, payments, 
and then you put a DTEX change layer. So in driving um, a, a sort of step change for cross-border arrangements, there is still a big gap in the actual infrastructure that Africa has. Because if you want to drive high-level payments uh, across the continent, let's talk of 54 countries, you're talking of two high-scale, what they call tier four data centers, each one costs about five million. Uh, you need about two years to three years to, to spin those up. You're gonna have a problem. So we need to look at a hub and spoke around developing infrastructure on the continent and figuring out how we use data passport, data residence, uh, and data embassies to host data uh, at, in a hub and spoke model across the continent. Then secondly, is now looking at efficient solutions using digital public goods. So as Africa Nenda, we've been busy at the moment helping countries build up payment systems using their own technology, using their own engineers to bring down the cost of those solutions so that by the time you have a technical solution which is affordable, then the return on investment for any player in that solution um, is reduced so that you can actually bring down again that challenge of the 12 to 24%. I'll stop there and I know we're gonna have a few more uh, you know, conversations in this area, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn now to Augustin Reyna. He is the head of legal and economic affairs at the European Consumer Association, BEOC. Um, and our question for you is, in anticipating the next three to five years, how do you foresee developments in digital financial services impacting consumer protection? And are there specific tools and frameworks that um, you'll find a particularly effective your experience in, from what you've seen in, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much also to CI, Elena, and everybody for such a well-organized Congress. It's been really a, a pleasure so far. I'm sure it will continue to be in the next, uh, in the next days. Um, how digital finance is going to evolve? That's a, a very big uh, question. Of course, we don't have a, a crystal ball, but we can see that things are developing pretty fast. And also has led um, Europe to start intervening, start regulating certain uh, practices on certain areas where we identify or have identified uh, certain risks for, for consumers. We can take the case, for example, of consumer credit. You know, Europe has recently reformed its um, consumer credit laws uh, in order to incorporate, for example, new practices such as buy now, pay later products, or to tackle um, predatory practices in relation to pay their loans. So all these new forms of lending money to people that can lead to over-indebtedness, but at the same time can uh, pose uh, difficulties you know, for people to engage with this type of market, with these service, um, service providers, and therefore default protections were, uh, were needed. It's also important um, to acknowledge that financial regulations in, in Europe seeks to establish certain obligations on, on companies, on parties about what to do or what not to do. But um, we have also been, been facing uh, difficulties about protecting consumers beyond information disclosure. And this is something that has uh, materialized, for example, in investment markets, where we thought that by giving information to consumers, they are going to make informed choices, and the reality has not materialized in that, in that way. Why? Because financial markets, per se, are extremely complex markets. You need not only the skills, and even if you have the skill to navigate from this, uh, through these markets, you need to be able to count on sufficient you know, support and advice by financial institu institutions that should be behold only to your interest and know their, their interests. And, and there is an ongoing discussion in, in Europe about how to deal with this type of situation, with this conflict of interest, and move away from this paradigm of information disclosure as the main consumer protection tool. What has this to do with digitalization? The fact that digitalization is there and is here to stay, on one side brings new opportunities, there is no doubt about that, but also risks. And the risks relate to exacerbating problems that we have in offline markets that we have not dealt with properly. And when coming to the case of, uh, of conflict of, uh, of interest, for example, and through this digitalization, and probably there are many you know, economists in the, in the rooms, you can actually uh, increase the transparency of the demand side. 
So you can know precisely what this consumer wants at this moment, how much he or sure they are willing to pay for certain, for certain products. And with such a level of transparency on the, consumer, on the consumer side, that means that the supply side can use that in their own benefits and not necessarily in the benefits of consumers. You mentioned that uh, many, many consumers here, they have their money you know, under the mattress. In Europe, they have their money in their bank accounts. And that is a problem because there is very little consumer engagement in financial markets. That money should be in circulation should be in circulation to finance, for example, the green transition. But instead, people do not put their money in financial markets because they do not trust them. And if they do not trust them, it's because these markets have been underperforming for consumers over all, over the, all these decades. So I think that this needs to be also a wake-up call for decision makers to realize on one side that digitalization brings indeed uh, opportunities. With that, it comes also risks. But won't, we won't be able um, to make the best out of this process if we don't deal with those problems that we have already identified in the offline world in order to ensure that consumers are not only protected, but also can make the best out of their, out of their money at the end of the day. Excellent. Um, I'd like to do a follow-on question for you. Um, how do you see innovation and technology playing a role in creating tools and features that not only drive financial inclusion, but also uphold responsible financial behavior? That's a, um, a very good question. Of course, technology can be used for, for good and in the benefit of, uh, of consumers. If we think about the markets, financial markets where uh, switching rates are extremely low, like uh, insurances, mm -hmm. no? or your, your um, uh, saving account, mm -hmm. um, through digitalization, we could actually increase market transparency in the sense of comparability, you know, increase switching, and therefore create more competitive markets. Mm -hmm. Right now, in Europe, and probably that's the case in other, in other parts of the, of the world, because consumers do not switch bank accounts or do not switch their, um, their insurances, they end up being penalized mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. your uh, insurance policies might, might, go, might go up, and you didn't go somewhere else where you could find a better, a better, a better product. So indeed, I think in this, in, in this regard, technology can provide opportunities for consumers, for consumer organizations um, to increase product comparability, but at the same time, the technology can also bring benefits in terms of financial inclusion. In Europe, we are discussing now um, the development of the digital euro. So basically, a digital version of cash. No. The objective of this is twofold. No, there is kind of a more broad geopolitical objective, you know, is of course to, to develop a, a digital version of the, of, the, of the currency. But at the heart of the, of the, of the project, there is the idea of development, developing a product and a service that is inclusive, that anybody should be able to access them. And why is that? We don't know how um, cash will evolve in the future. We don't know if we are going to continue paying with notes and coins. So we need to have a system in place that is going to be as inclusive as cash. There is no payment system that is as inclusive as cash. And we need to preserve that. Because if you think, um, for example, about you know, the, the Nordics uh, in, in Europe, I have several colleagues um, here, you will think that these are you know, very digitalized countries. And it's true, they're super digitalized, you know? but that came with a cost. And now we're seeing that. Because you see that um, uh, a lot of consumers, especially vulnerable consumers, have difficulties actually to make electronic payments, partly because of lack of skills, <coughs> but sometimes for, because of very basic reasons like not having the latest phone to make a safe transaction. Right. And I think that there is where we also need to, um, to pay special attention that perhaps we went too far and too fast on digitalization without thinking properly of not leaving anybody behind. Excellent points. Uh, at this point, if anyone has to, things to jump in, please do. Jump into that um, question. And I'm going to give an African uh, example. Um, so I was, in, I was invited to uh, a meeting with, 
various policy uh, makers. And um, one, I'm gonna get myself in trouble, but let me go ahead. One of the central bank governors uh, was very happy about his innovation uh, approach. So within the central bank, they, they span up an innovation team um, and he was presenting to about 60 other central bank governors um, and I was in the panel and um, so he said, look, he's got a separate team doing innovation uh, and then he went ahead to, to tell us what he was doing in the innovation lab and I almost fell off my chair. Um, so, of course, because they're my key stakeholders, I, I, I managed them very carefully. So I congratulated him on, on the fact that he separated his BAU team from his innovation team. I'm like, well done, Mr. Governor, that's excellent. Um, and you can't go and ask the governor, why are you working on something that has been solved in another country 15 years ago? Uh, which is what his innovation team was, was doing. Uh, so I, I think there's a need also to figure out what I call imitation to innovation, where we, 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 we localize, but from a policy, from a technology, from a route to market, if it's been done somewhere else, just cut and paste. Localize, that's, that's important, because you'll do your usual elements. Um, but I think that's an important piece, because if, <coughs> from an African perspective, we want to try and, and, and run, and we need to run fast. Uh, we, we cannot have different central banks or policy makers figuring out things that have already been in existence in other markets for 10 years. It, it, they just need to be very clear and, and say, let's copy, uh, and, and copy with the localization. That's the bit I just wanted to add, because I think that's also how you also accelerate innovation, because innovation doesn't mean do something new. It could be do something that's been done, but tweak it to your local context. Thank you. Um, great. Well, why don't we bring you in, uh, Shamina, uh, to an answer the next question. So, are you still there with us? I am. I am. Okay. Yes. Okay. How can partnerships between public, civil society, and private sector be leveraged to develop and promote industry-wide initiatives that prioritize responsible digital finance practices? And how does the digital public infrastructure come into play here? Uh, where do you see some room for improvement? Yeah, I think it's a great question and builds on the, um, the really excellent comments of the panelists. Um, you know, I was just thinking as Robert was talking about fraud and scams. And this year, uh, I somebody used my identity to, um, to, to perpetrate a fraud and um, uh, on, on a WhatsApp channel or whatever. And so this was uh, not in Fiji, but it was in, it was in another market. Um, and it just makes me think that, you know, again, as we think about the consumer at the center of the conversation, um, what do we really want from any of these systems? We want to know that if we buy something, we get what we pay for. And if it's not what we are paying for, we want recourse to say, I didn't get what I paid for. I want to be protected. I want to get my money back. I want to get a different product. I want to get a different thing. We want that experience to be seamless, safe, and, and, and simple for the consumer. So what does that mean? It means that all of the complexity that we've been talking about here has to happen sort of behind the scenes. It has to be something that a consumer doesn't have to think about because their experience and the price of that experience results in a transaction that it's them. We call it working for them, not against them. So how does what does that mean in terms of collaboration structure and things like that? It means that the technology, the data, the rules of the road, the harmonization of regulation, the payment systems, all of these things have to work in partnership and close coordination with each other at a pace that is keeping up with supply, demand, and technology. And I think that's why um, we're very interested in this conversation because I think that there is a very strong role here for private sector actors, to, to Robert's point, who have had experience in global markets for 50 years, not even 10 years, not even five years, but have experience working in these places to make that experience for the consumer as safe and secure and simple as possible. Um, I think that the prospect of a digital 
um, infrastructure that reduces costs for everybody has to ensure that we also maintain the protections for everyone. And I think at its core, that means that the consumer has to experience um, a transaction where I don't know if they do right now universally in any of the markets, but um, that ensures that they get what they pay for. And if they don't, uh, they have recourse in that conversation. The one thing I can say is that for the transactions that happen across uh, a network and in partnership with the Center for Inclusive Growth, that's a built-in um, construct of a card payment that has been in place um, since the beginning. And so I think, again, as we're thinking about new technologies, copy the things that work, cut and paste those things into the system, um, and then use the thing that benefits uh, the consumers in the easiest, fastest, and most transparent way possible. Thank you. Uh, Seema, we'll turn to you. Uh, how can feedback mechanisms be established to incorporate the voices and concerns of users in the development of digital financial services? Um, incorporating user feedback is crucial for um, the development of user-centric uh, digital financial services. And uh, I believe, you know, there should be um, the, the financial, the digital financial providers should conduct regular surveys and focus group discussions to actually understand the user experience and, and you know, their concerns and the preferences regarding the digital financial services. What we have seen is it's like um, the perception of uh -huh. the digital... <laughs> the perception of the you know the digital platform um, developers is that they know what the consumer demand, what the preference is, and they just move <laughs> on to developing the platforms. And actually, the experiences, the preferences are not incorporated. Um, I feel they are just focusing on the profitability side of it um, because based on the discussion with the um, e-mobile um, you know, providers, what I uh, got from that is that they're not interested in, in there's no sense of uh, you know, or duty of care. They're not interested in um, you know, making sure that uh, they get the uh, feedback or the experiences to, uh, and, and uh, any focus on uh, consumer protection uh, policies. But what concerns them is development of the platforms. So I think through surveys and feedbacks, they'll be able to understand what exactly um, the consumers want, what are the experiences. Um, also, you know, uh, because they are already online, they can establish online um, um, forums and uh, community platforms whereby, you know, uh, they can provide a space to the users uh, for raising or asking questions, for providing feedback and engaging in discussions about the digital financial services. Uh, what we have seen is, uh, you know, uh, when there is a development and uh, implementation of any digital service um, solutions or platforms, um, the users are not actually, you know, used in the testing phase. Uh, most of the time that is done internally and they believe that everything is okay, it's ready for uh, implementation, but they refuse to bring in um, you know, the, the, the end users and using them to test the platforms and then provide them with the feedback as to how they can improve their platforms before the implementation. Um, so for example, just recently, a national payment system has been developed and implemented and, you know, it, there was a numerous request made by um, Consumer Council of Fiji to include um, Consumer Council as a consumer rep so that we can discuss you know, the issues and concerns, but you know, that was not considered. So we believe that we are, you know, we are on the forefront of, um, you know, we receive consumer complaints relating to digital financial services, and we could have been a great help in developing a good national payment system, but um, that was not considered. That request was totally, you know, not considered. Um, and then the absence of a good complaint resolution mechanism in re relation to this space. So I believe that if there is an implementation of effective complaint resolution mechanisms, that will allow um, users to report their issues and a prompt resolution uh, will, that will definitely demonstrate a commitment to address user concerns and you know that way they can gain the trust of the, the users but that is currently lacking. I mean I don't know about the rest of the, uh, the places but for Fiji I see that is lacking a great deal. 
Uh, Robert, projecting forward, what does the future hold for the next three to five years? Uh, Laura, Laura this, this is a very dangerous question, a very difficult question. <laughs> um, everything uh, that I've learned says never try and uh, project the future. But um, I think there are a couple of tailwinds uh, that are upon us already. Um, the issue of digital public infrastructure uh, and, and how that uh, is, is set to, to accelerate um, at a global level, I think, is, is already there. So if you, if, you, if you look at that, then I think that's going to be an opportunity. Um, data exchange, um, uh, there's going to be, a, there has to be, I think, um, some element of policy, um, well, not necessarily harmonization, but let's, this issue of fragmented policy arrangements. Uh, I think there's going to be a realization that that needs to be uh, dealt with so that we deal with um, consumer protection issues, uh, technology issues, innovation. Um, so again, I think because of the knowledge based on the sharing that's taking place today, we might see an acceleration in, in, in that so that um, people that were doing um, uh, sort, of, sort of acts for, for, for central banks that would take three years, that can now be done in six months by benchmarking and, and looking at what other people have done. Um, I think you're going to see uh, the growth of open source. Uh, we're already seeing that with India building UPI. Um, Brazil, I think the number they put in The Economist was about $4 million for, um, for one of the most successful uh, payment arrangements globally, uh, which is now serving 130 million people. And they bring 75 million people uh, into the financial inclusion bracket in under two years. So I think we need to learn from that, and I think that tailwind is upon us. And again, that's, that's the whole uh, DPI, DPG space. Uh, and, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll still see partnerships. And I think to, to the point of, of, of taking uh, lessons learned from, from others. So you don't, if somebody has spent, uh, I don't know what number that was, but for something in the region of a couple of million dollars developing a fraud management system, and that becomes a digital public good, rather plug into that and try and build your own, because that learning curve of yours will take, you know, God knows how many years. So I'm hoping that we see those things beginning uh, to, 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 to come, so that we actually uh, bring in more people uh, and bring them in in a matter that, that, that sort of meets uh, elements of consumer protection. I hope I've answered the question, but very okay. difficult question. Great. So uh, let's take some questions from the audience. You've got food for thought from the panelists, and are there any questions from the room? Thinking End of, all the of the day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. If there aren't any questions from the room, we'll go to the next part of, of the program. And if something does occur to you, just interrupt the session and, and raise your hand, because we'd love to hear from you. So um, one of the things that we I asked the panelists to do, um, because again, we are thinking about how um, in the first panel of the day, it said, let's not just talk about challenges. Let's walk away from this talking about solutions and actions. And so given that we really want to be um, focused on the actions that we can take as a community, I'd like for each of the panelists to say between one to three um, actions that you think are really critical to happen before the next Congress. Why don't we start with you, Robert? Um, yeah, I think we should set up um, a knowledge, if it's not there, where we can share quickly best practice. Um, that, to me, would be quite critical. Uh, that will, again, reduce. I'm, I'm all about reducing the gap uh, in, 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 the, in, in gaps in terms of knowledge. That would be one, uh, one area. Um, second is to try uh, and, and look at maybe a consumer um, focus group as well, where whatever is being played out, you've got consumers who you can sort of soundboard uh, to, to, as you're discussing. So you get the voice of the customer. This to me is very important because I think a lot of times we, we design uh, in a vacuum um, and then you, you, uh, you come back later. I'm going to give just one quick example of that. Uh, so I was in the telco industry and we brought in a consultant to spend 
you know, three, four months telling us what the problem was, and this was actually M-Pesa. So once you send the money, what's the first thing that happens? They realize they sent the money to the wrong person, they call the call center. And, and some consultant came, spent three, four months after a couple of million dollars telling us that, and we're like, yeah, we know that already. So what did we do? We then built a confirmation. Are you sending money to this person? Right, so, so do you need another company to go and, and, and go through that same learning? Um, so we need to exchange information. Uh, so that to me is very critical. So a mechanism for, for knowledge transfer. Thank you. Um, I think my biggest achievement would be, you know, if I could come back on this very stage and say that, you know, Fiji now has a very good consumer protection policies, uh, legislations and regulations to protect consumers from uh, the digital financial uh, service frauds. Um, so currently there are some works going on, but as a consumer champion, it will be a great achievement for me if that is done. Um, because, you know, as I said, every day consumers are being, you know, are being scammed of their hard end. Um, I would also would like to see a lot of collaborative approaches between different stakeholders like um, the private sector, the public sector, and um, um, uh, the civil society organizations. That is happening, but uh, it's quite slow, so I want to see them coming out very strongly, pushing for, you know, um, consumer rights and, uh, and um, you know, a good um, digital financial landscape. So I think I will just, um, uh, if I'm able to achieve this too, that will be a big, yeah, big achievement for definitely, me. Definitely, definitely. How about you, Augustine? From, from my side, I will say, um, being inspired by, by each other. And I think that we can all learn something from, from uh, each of us. Uh, there is a, a wealth, wealth of knowledge in this, uh, in this room and in this, in this community. Uh, of course, we, we cannot pretend that um, uh, laws are going to be copy-pasted. Each jurisdiction is specific, has its own challenges, its own traditions, but we can get inspired by, by each other. And I have a, a very practical example. Eh? At the um, European level, we are discussing right now um, how to deal with uh, payment frauds. You know, who should be accountable uh, in case of payment frauds? Um, and in the, in the UK, there has uh, been an extremely important development that is started with a, with a campaign by, by which basically to make the banks uh, accountable. It should, the issue not be on the shoulders of the consumer alone. It's a very progressive legislation that we are trying to import in the EU. Uh, uh, some time ago, the, the UK was part of the EU, but I will spare you the details of that. Um, but there is a, a way in which we can learn from each other and see what best practices can work in our um, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, similarly, we were talking about the case of conflicts of, uh, of, of interest. Again, we're trying to get laws passed at European level that ban these conflicts of interest when it comes to financial advice. In Europe, only the UK and the Netherlands are the only countries that have banned this conflict of interest. And again, we're trying to bring that at the European level and be inspired by the practices that have worked in other countries. And I'm completely sure that it will be the same if we will look also at practices in other, in other regions and, and countries around the world. Great, thank you. And Shamina, I'm actually going to turn to you. You can give your thoughts um, on the most pressing actions that need to be taken. Do that first. But then uh, Shamina has a special announcement for the room as well, and so we'll end on that announcement. Over Great, to you. and uh, thank you. Thank you again for for including us here today. Um, I do think that the uh, I think the pressing issues that maybe we didn't cover as much that hopefully other panels will talk about is is data privacy. Um, I think that that's a huge issue. As soon as as much as we're talking about digital infrastructure and things like that, I think it's incumbent upon us who are in these positions of privilege and authority to really think through the impact of data privacy and who owns the data, who benefits from the data, who securitizes the data. Um, and so I do think that that's an area 
for future, um, well, for hopefully continued conversation. Um, I think based on the, the conversation here today, I feel uh, really honored and really excited now to share that we are partnering um, with Consumers International to create um, a new program, a new global initiative called, uh, the working title is really about building the consumer voice into digital finance. Um, based on all of the topics that we talked about here, uh, here today, the consumer's voice needs to be the, the default for any of these programs that we're talking about. And so what this initiative will do um, is do kind of exactly what this panel did, which is bring together the various stakeholders across the spectrum to create um, the right incentives so that uh, whether you're a consumer organization, you're a private sector company, you're a public sector organization, you have or a government, you're working with your best assets to ensure that uh, you bring the best to the conversation. And I think that this new office, this new office that will build in consumer voice by default is going to do just that. It's a multi-year initiative. And so we are kicking it off with Consumers International. But the idea is to crowd in um, other players um, and other voices into the conversation. But uh, we're very excited to launch it. We've been working very closely with Consumers International and the leadership team to develop something that is really um, in service of the consumer to ensure that indeed technology works for us and not against us. So, so thank you all so much for the time today and I enjoyed being part of the conversation. Thank you very much. And that concludes the session today.